Hey there, thanks for joining me at Sonoma Valley Church of the Nazarene today. Some of you might know that over the years I have done my share of open ocean sailing. And the first thing that a seasoned sailor does when he boards a new boat is become familiar with its rigging, with its deck layout, and the location and condition of its safety equipment. Now there's basically only a few different designs, but you want to become familiar with them. You don't want to be guessing where things are in the dark during an emergency. And your familiarity can not only save your life, but can prevent a lot of frustration on a dark and a stormy night. Well, sometimes I find myself careless with other aspects of my life. Sometimes when I'm getting ready to head out the door, for example, in the morning, I can't remember where I've left my car keys or I, where I've placed my wallet or my sunglasses. And I usually chalk these moments up to not having more important things on my mind. But the truth is that these items are just not very important in the overall scheme of things. But you don't want to treat God like these common things, do we? God demands a place of primacy in our life if we want to enjoy a vital relationship with him. We need to treat God as if we were boarding a sailboat, if we really want to experience the abundant life that we've been promised. Making time, creating a rule of life, is all about staying healthy physically and spiritually. And we don't want, if we don't keep God at the center of our life, things tend to spin out of control. Well, using sailor vernacular, I would say we want to remain on watch so that we can arrive at our destination safe and secure. Albert Einstein said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and inspecting, expecting a different result. Well, in our case today, it's not doing something that we know that we should and then expecting to be blessed anyway. Now, we find ourselves this morning in the book of Hosea, chapter 7. Israel was living as though the creator and sustainer of the universe, the father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, had no real effect on the world while expecting to be blessed. And they continued to ignore God and his advances. Now, I am pretty sure that that meets my definition of insanity. Good morning, thanks again for joining me today. Last week, we learned that Yahweh, the God of Israel, was brokenhearted because God's people had lost all sense of themselves. They were just going through the motions with regard to their worship practices, but their worship lacked integrity. And you might remember that Hosea was the first of the 12 minor prophets. He prophesied near the end of the reign of Jeroboam second, uh, just before the invasion of the Assyrian army in 722. And this book stands as a reflection of a great loss that would change the course of the history of Israel and Judah forever. Well, let's look at our passage this morning, beginning in chapter 7, but first, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we come here today intentionally because we do not want to treat you like you are common and but we want to give you the place of primacy in our lives. And as we open up your word this morning, I pray that you would speak to your people, that we would hear from you, and that we would take your words to heart today as we leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, beginning in verse 1, we read, when I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim and the evil deeds of Samaria was uncovered, for they deal falsely. The thief enters in, bandits are at raid outside, and they do not consider in their hearts that I remember their wickedness. Now their deeds are all around them. They are ever before my face. With their wickedness, they make the king and the princes glad with their lies. They are all adulterers, like an oven heated by a baker who ceases to stir the fire during the kneading of the dough until it's leavened. And on the day of the king, the princes become sick with the heat of wine. They stretch out their hands with the scoffers, for their hearts are like an oven as they approach their plotting. Their anger smolders all night, and in the morning it burns like a flaming fire. All of them are hot like an oven, and they consume their rulers, and all the kings have fallen, and none of them calls on me. Ephraim mixes himself with the nations. 
Ephraim has become like a cake not turned. Strangers devour his strength, yet he does not know it. Gray hairs are also sprinkled on him, yet he does not know it. Through their pride, Israel testifies against them, yet they have neither returned to the Lord, their God, nor have they sought him through any of this. Ephraim has become like a silly dove, without any sense. They call on Egypt, but they go to Assyria. This is the word of the Lord to you. Thanks be to God. Well, as we look at this section of scripture, what is Yahweh's concern? Hosea is speaking for God in this passage. We can see that God's grief continues. Now, if you remember last week, Hosea explained that God had told him to marry a prostitute. Yahweh would use Hosea's marriage to speak to Israel about their lack of relational fidelity and the consequences of their spiritual complacency. God views his lack of primacy in their relationship as an act of betrayal toward him and toward the covenant. Remember the words of the covenant? If you will be my people, I will be your God. And in this chapter, God begins, when I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered. Now remember, Ephraim was the religious, cultural, economic center of Israel. Their condition had reached beyond the fringes of society, all the way to its very core. Israel had a serious heart condition, one that infects the very being of their identity. And when their inequity was uncovered, the problem was seen to be spiritual, moral, and political, and it permeated all areas of their life. Throughout the land, from top to bottom, corruption, their conduct, their immoral conditions, like deceit, Burglary, thieving was rampant, yet Israel hardly noticed, and they were acting as if Yahweh, their God, was unaware. Now the psalmist would say that uh, the fool says in his heart that there is no God, but this is exactly how Israel was behaving. So God wonders in verse 2 at their ability to believe that they could hide their wickedness from them. They do not consider in their hearts that I remember their wickedness. Now their deeds are all around them and they're ever before my face. And as if this was not bad enough, in the next verse he says, with their wickedness they make the kings and the princes glad with their lies. If this was a New Testament passage, I would be tempted to quote the Apostle Paul who would say that these kinds of people were those who know God's righteous deeds but fail to obey them. And that those who do those things deserve death Yet, they not only continue to do these things, but they heartily approve of others who do the same. Well, what evil deeds is God remembering? He is remembering a war between Israel and Judah in which 200,000 women and children of their own kinsmen were taken into captivity as slaves. God had delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt, and it was unimaginable to him that they could ever consider doing such a thing. This story can be found in in 2 Chronicles, but I wanna focus this morning on the situation as it's related in this particular passage here. What's this story here? God is pointing to the current political situation that's happening during Hosea's ministry. This was a crazy time in Israel. During this period, there were six different kings that ruled over a 25 year history, just before the fall of the northern kingdom. Scheming, plotting, assassinations characterized the political landscape. Talk about divisive. Most of these kings did evil in the eyes of the Lord, but even those who did right in the eyes of the Lord failed to pull down the altars to Baal in the high places or to set a high moral standard. Now in these verses that follow, God makes reference to the political leadership as adulterous like an oven heated by a baker, where they would remain drunk in the morning until after the inauguration of the king, while at the same time, the scoffers whose hearts were heated up and inflamed were already plotting the next overthrow. This reflected the total spiritual and moral failure of the existing politics of the day. But here's the big point that God is making. None of them calls on me. If they had called on me, surely I would have heard and I would have answered. And in the remaining verses, we see the insanity of Israel's response. 
Ephraim lean, was beginning to lean on its own understanding and create alliances with other nations. Ephraim turns from God to Egypt to protect them from Assyria, and they are like a cake that's not turned. And when we don't turn the cake over at its proper time, it gets burned on one side. It begins to look like flatbread. Egypt had Egypt's interests at heart, and not Israel's, and they would ultimately devour their strength. And it will happen slowly, so that they would not even notice, which is the reference to their gray hairs. But make no mistake, this is arrogant pride on their part. Yet they have neither returned to the Lord, their God, nor have they sought them through all of this. So Ephraim, uh, Hosea says, has become like a silly dove, without any sense. They call to Egypt to save them, but they're going to Assyria. The consequences of these actions are inevitable because God will not be mocked. God never glosses over sin. Just because we are God's chosen people and participants of the covenant does not mean that we are exempt from the consequences of our actions. Israel will fall and be taken into captivity. But if only they really knew God, if they remembered his graciousness and his faithfulness, then they would have trusted him. Absence does not make our heart grow fonder. When we allow our spiritual condition to grow cold, we eventually face the music. God desires our intimacy, but he both deserves and demands our reverence. And if we are wise, we'll bear that in mind. Still, God is compassionate, and he doesn't leave us in our deplorable condition. But this is, however, where Israel finds herself in the moment where they failed to remember God's faithfulness and provision. And she continues down this path of insanity. Well, in the next chapter or so, the inevitable happens. And when it does, like most of us, they whine and they complain. They, they somehow believe that God has failed to hold up his end of the covenant. And they shake their fists at God, and they wonder at his silence. And this is a miserable state to find yourself. But God will not be mocked. And this is not like they have not been mourned. Hosea continues to reveal God's heart uh, in chapter 11. And I just can't let this sermon end right here, as important as it is, where again we hear the voice of God. And, and God says, When Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. The more I called him, the more he went from me. They kept sacrificing to the balls and burning incense to idols. Yet it... It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took him in my arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with the cords of a man, with the bonds of love. I became to them as if one who lifts the yoke from their shoulders. And it was I who bent down and fed them. They will not return to the land of Egypt, but to Assyria. He will be their king because they have refused to return to me. And the sword will whirl against their cities and demolish their gate bars and consume them because of their counsels. So my people are bent on turning from me. Yet despite God's condemnation and the harshness with which this unavoidable judgment must come, Hosea pleads with them to turn, while at the same time proclaiming God's compassionate and covenant love that in the end, finally cannot let Israel go. I love the Minor Prophets because they so often speak to us in situations that are easy for us to identify with. So my question for you today is, does Israel have a future? What does this mean for us today? Well, Israel does have a future. Though Israel is unfaithful, God will uphold his end of the covenant. There is a future for Israel because Yahweh is a God who calls forth. A God who is able to create new possibilities, all evidence to the contrary. Yahweh is a God of the impossible, whose love has no bounds. And Israel will, redeemed, will be redeemed once again and returned to their land. Israel will come to her senses and repent for a time. Israel will finally respond to God's advances and promises and call no more to foreign gods. And this response will place God back at the center of, of their life. And yet again, God will extend his grace with these words. 
God says, I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like the lily, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. His shoots will sprout, and his beauty will be like the olive tree, his fragrance like the cedars of Lebanon. And then Hosea concludes with an affirmation. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and righteous will walk in them. But the transgressors will stumble and fall. And so my question today for you is, where are you in your spiritual walk? With this isolation and this pandemic, it is easy for us to get in the habit of attend not attending to our spiritual lives. It seems clear to me that God is doing something new in the midst of this pandemic. Let us rest and be assured of that. God is able to do a new thing, all evidence to the contrary. Our God is a God of the impossible. Yahweh's accusation against Israel was that they, when they found themselves in dire circumstances, they didn't even call on him or he would have answered. Hosea's admonition to us today is, Hang in there. Stay connected. Remain faithful. Be patient. Remain confident. God can be trusted. And while it may be unclear as to what this new thing is that God is doing right at this moment, it is more important than ever that we remain close so that we can hear his voice when God does speak. And until he does, we must continue to be the church. God's responsibility representative community in a world that is full of chaos. Let's close in prayer. Lord God in heaven, we are so grateful to be reminded of your faithfulness to your people. We are encouraged this morning as we obediently wait on you. We live in a world that has been clearly shaken. Let us be the church, your voice of love and reason in a world that is looking for answers in all of the wrong places. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for joining me today. God bless you. Go in peace.
but you are.